impact assessments to preserve affordable housing and increase community well-being. My name is Janet Viveris, and I'm a senior research associate at the National Housing Conference. Joining me on this webinar today are Teresa Bryce, Jane Pearson, and Gloria Munoz. Teresa Bryce has been the executive director of LISC, the Lo Local Initiative Support Corporation of Phoenix, since 2006 and has led the office's successful foreclosure initiative, the development of the Neighbors United Sustainable Communities Program, and the formation of the Sustainable Communities Work Group in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Jane Pearson has had a long career in the public health and nonprofit sector, including many positions within Arizona Department of Health Services, such as Assistant Director of Community and Family Health. Since 2012, she has served as a health consultant with LISC Phoenix. Gloria Munoz is the Executive Director of the Housing Authority of Maricopa County. She provides leadership for the management of over 900 units of public housing, three tax credit developments, and 2,200 Section 8 vouchers, including two project-based Section 8 contracts. She is currently redeveloping several public housing projects using the HUD-RAD program. Before I turn the webinar over to Gloria, uh, Teresa, and Jane, I'd like to thank Capital One for sponsoring NHC's webinar series. Any opinions or errors in this webinar, however, are ours alone. Uh, just a few technical notes. First, let's cover the most frequently asked question. Is this webinar being recorded? Yes, the webinar is being recorded and an archived copy of it will be made available to everyone who registered via a link online. We will email this out to you within 48 hours. Second, please note that all the participant lines are muted to ensure clear sound quality for everyone. However, we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar. If you have a question at any time during the presentation, please submit it through the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. That's the box I've outlined in red here in the screenshot. We'll answer as many of your questions as possible at the end of the webinar. And finally, let's address technical difficulties. While we hope the webinar runs smoothly for everyone, we all know that doesn't always happen. If you run into any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the help menu at the top of the GoToWebinar control panel to locate technical support. If that does not work, please visit the GoToWebinar Support website, support.citrixonline.com. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand things over to Teresa, Jane, and Gloria. Thank you, Janet. Um, and thank you for that introduction. I'm now convinced that the most frightening words in the English language are, we are experiencing technical difficulties. So we, we also hope that we don't have any te technical difficulties and, and can provide this information. Um, I think we're going to be telling you a very compelling story today um, that has had some wonderful results already. And with, um, without further ado, we're going to have Gloria Munoz um, give you an idea of uh, what this project is, where it's located, and the significance of the project. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Um, what I'd like to do is introduce you to Cofet Lamoureux, and if you look at the map on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, the green outline is the outline of the development itself. It's a public housing uh, development that was developed in, 19, in the early 50s. It's one of our oldest properties owned and operated by the Housing Authority. It consists of 296 units. They are one to four bedroom, pretty much barrack style. If you can see the photo, you can see that it's pretty much barrack style, single level. Um, it's 151 buildings over a 38-acre parcel, surrounded by light industrial. You can see that in the blue. And um, the copperish color on the map is the elementary school, Hamilton School, that's immediately adjacent to the property. On two sides of the property, we have a uh, very busy highway, freeway, um, on both sides that um, also creates some air quality issues for the project. Um, when I came to the agency uh, four years ago, we were looking at a demolition 
disposition plan under Section 18 under the HUD program. Um, we have abandoned um, that idea of demo dispo and are moving forward with a different plan for the property. Um, this slide will show you to the left um, a visual of what the property currently looks like. Um, it's, it's very, very um, minimal in regards to the uh, landscaping plan, um, very, very plain uh, looking um, unit. The resident profile at, Co at Cofell currently is about 90% female head of household, 71% uh, Hispanic, and 20% African American. <coughs> the average income is fairly low at 10000 annually with an average rent of about 140 when the project is fully leased, because it's in the redevelopment mode right now, um, we don't have it fully leased. We have about 500 adults and um, a lot of children, about 600 children live at the property fully leased. Um, in 2012, after entering the agency four years ago, we decided to uh, develop a housing strategy around all of our public housing. And COFAT was a priority one for us to um, develop some type of strategy um, to maintain the housing. In 2012, HUD approved and rolled out the Rental Assistance Demonstration RAD program. Um, we decided COFAT was a good candidate for this program, so we did apply for the conversion. And what the conversion is is converting it from public housing to Section 8 contract and did receive approval from HUD to move forward with RAD. Um, part of the RAD program included developing a financing strategy for the property, so we are going to be using low-income housing tax credits, historic credits, and other soft funds to the tune of about $43 million to develop uh, COFEL. Um, we decided very, very early in the process to bring in a lot of partners. Um, it's a huge project, 38 acres is a lot of property in a neighborhood. We brought in a lot of partners to uh, strategize around uh, putting this project together, and that's when we decided on the health impact assessment would be a good tool for us to have in determining and making decisions as we move the project forward. Um, this is another photo of Cofeld and what it looks like today. Um, and later in the presentation, we'll, we'll show you photos of what it's going to look like when it's redeveloped. Now we're going to have Jane Pearson, who was the uh, overall consultant for the health impact assessment, um, explain to the um, non-health sector members of us, what is a health impact assessment? Jane? Good afternoon. Um, so the health impact assessment you may have heard of is becoming uh, much more common um, in, in the general vernacular, and people begin uh, it's the kind of newest, fattiest thing. But so let's talk about what it is and what it's not. Uh, it is a multidisciplinary process that's used to evaluate the potential of health effects of a policy or project on on a population. Um, it's it's important to recognize it's different than a needs assessment. People frequently make the the see it as the same. A needs assessment goes in and broadly looks at a community or, or a population and comes up with recommendations. This is really specifically designed around a, a, a po potential or a proposed policy or project. So it's, this, it's very narrow. It uses uh, evidence from both scientific literature, information from stakeholders, qualitative and quantitative analysis of both primary and secondary data. Um, I think it's also characterized by intense community engagement. And um, in this case, it was the residents, but in other uh, cases, it's, it's the population that's most likely to be affected. And then finally, it identifies evidence-based strategies and recommendations that could either mitigate identified stress, threats or promote healthy decisions. So from Liz's perspective, uh, and this is Teresa, um, it was important for us to take a look at this opportunity in the context of our other place-based work. Um, LISC nationally um, has adopted what we call a Building Sustainable Communities Initiative, which really asks us to focus our comprehensive community revitalization efforts in very specific targeted neighborhoods. Central City South was that neighborhood for us, and we worked with a local nonprofit partner, Phoenix Revitalization Corporation. And the area that uh, Central City South uh, was 
targeted, the, the area of the neighborhood, is outlined here. You can see just the um, western edge of the target neighborhood outlined in yellow right here. The Central City South neighborhood that was actually part of the um, comprehensive planning effort stretches actually 19 blocks to the east from Central Avenue to 19th, 19th Avenue to the west, and then from just below um, Jefferson to uh, the freeway here, the freeway being the, the, the lower, the south edge of the target neighborhood. What's significant is that Cofelt was separated from the target neighborhood by 19th Avenue, which was a very, very busy um, intersection. And it was really quite um, isolated and inaccessible to the rest of the community. Um, when we heard about health impact assessments through St. Luke's Health Initiatives, which was a partner of ours, in um, helping to look at the planning for Central City South, we thought, well, this is a great opportunity. We'd heard that the Housing Authority was taking a look at redeveloping its portfolio. We knew that Cofelt was immediately adjacent to this area that we had already invested four and a half years in. And we thought we'd bring the parties together. Um, Phoenix Revitalization Corporation was very anxious to make inroads at connecting to the residents of Cofelt. And we felt that it would be good to, to introduce the County Housing Authority and the County Health Department um, and have the conversation about whether or not a health impact assessment would be um, a good tool for them. We were very sensitive to the fact that we did not want to interrupt the process that was already in place. It was very important to, to get in early into this process so that we could provide um, feedback and recommendations and strategies that could be incorporated as the scope of work was being developed by the, by the developer and the housing authority. In terms of funding, how much did the health impact assessment cost? Well, the total cost just for the uh, health impact assessment was $30,000. We used our HUD Section 4 capacity building grant um, essentially to fund Phoenix Revitalization to engage the residents, assist in the health impact assessment, and secure the experts uh, that were needed, uh, like epidemiologists and, and other health experts, to actually complete the study. Um, subsequently, after the main part of the study was finished, um, we also funded uh, the subcontractor to do a case study, which is much smaller and much more readable. And you'll get links to that at the end. So now we're going to ask Gloria to talk about why the Housing Authority felt that a health impact assessment for Cofelt was a good idea. Once we looked at the opportunity to um, redevelop Cofelt, um, the Housing Authority's position was we really, really want to make it comprehensive and improve not only the lives for the residents and the rooftops there, but also the neighborhood and the community. So the redevelopment has a uh, huge potential to directly and indirectly affect the health incomes for not only the residents, but the whole community. So the redevelopment and knowing what the health impact um, assessment recommendations and what would be identified would be key in determining um, development decisions for us. So we think the potential to improve the neighborhood and the health of the residents is a great opportunity for us to basically do a development correct and do it right. When, when it's so large in the community, I mean, you're talking about 38 acres and you're talking about 600, 500 adults. And Gloria, wouldn't you say that um, it was really important to integrate this public housing into the larger neighborhood. I mean, what, that was one of the issues that we wanted to address was that sort of isolation and that so, social stigmatization that comes with public housing. And by looking at strategies that were going to address the broader impact, we could engage the surrounding neighborhoods and, and improve the entire area. Which is a very, very good point, because as we um, move forward with our financing plan and, and move forward with the rollout of the health impact assessment and what we're doing for COPEL, many people say we drive down 19th and we've never seen this project. Mm -hmm. It's pretty interesting how it just is an invisible piece of, a, of the community and it sits over 38 acres. That's right. Well, we're going to ask Jane now to talk us through um, this specific uh, process of a health impact assessment. And she's going to spend some time really helping to explain um, these, in, the entire steps and, and how these apply to COFELT. So Jane, go take it away. Thank you. Uh, well, as you can see on your screen, um, there are six steps uh, for a health impact assessment, or we call them HIA. Um, screening, scoping, assessment, recommendations, reporting, monitoring, and evaluating. Um, this 
this doesn't look like rocket science, and probably many of you think, well, you know, this is the same as you would do for just about any other problem-solving process, which is absolutely true. So, uh, but let me talk about what, how it's defined in terms of uh, doing a HIA. And we'll go through using Copelt as an example, each of the, these steps. So the first, I combine the screening and scoping together, um, is really to understand the scope of the project, not uh, and the, and define really the questions that need to be answered, um, and understand uh, what the project is, or or in some cases the policy question, but in this case the project is. And what are the issues that um, seem to be relevant to to the project? And um, so, in order to do that, you begin talking to a variety of people. And in this case, um, we began first and foremost with um, the housing authority, really getting having Gloria under, tell us what she wanted to accomplish, what the project was, and what she thought the issues might be. We act, continued to um, make contact with a variety of people, um, the local school district, the developer, um, health experts, um, just sort of surveying uh, the community and, and understanding where things are. The idea is to determine if this is really um, lends itself to a HIA. In this case, it did. And um, so we went to the next step of And this. before we leave this, Jane, Gloria, tell us why the local school district was such an important player here in terms of uh, the, the school population. Well, the school district was extremely important because we populate the school by 80%. Yeah. So we are a major, major player with the school immediately next door. And so it was very important for us to contact the school district and work with the local school to determine you know, where they are, where's their plan for the school. So if this went away, what would happen? Mm -hmm. Plus and they also have the resources. And then they have tons of resources at the school that they could, you know, we could collaborate at the site with. Mm -hmm. so. so before we move on, at the end of sort of this preliminary screening and scoping, that's when we began forming the team, because this begins to determine who needs to be on the team. Uh, there are some core people that are probably always on a, a team. That includes um, a public health professional, a planning professional. But in this case, we included also a, uh, an environmental person. Um, we included housing people. We included, um, and certainly, we included um, the local Community Development Corporation, or PRC, because of their connection in the neighborhood in with the community. Uh, so this is where we put together the team. And then we go forward to the next step of what we call assessment. Now, I need to point out that this is, even though we've set it up as sort of looking like it's linear, this isn't a linear process. So it's more of an iterative process. So as we begin the assessment process, we either verify some of the initial um, perceptions we had of the, of the scope of the project, or we determine they, they weren't, in fact, important, or we hear or learn about other issues that are important that we didn't know about before. So it keeps kind of going back and forth over, a, over the next, um, through the assessment process. Um, so the first thing we did as part of an assessment is uh, conduct workshops or charrettes. And, and Teresa tells me that most of you know what a charrette is. But for those of us in public health, um, it's the next, next best thing to slice bread. I mean, we think it's so exciting to do. It makes um, this, uh, it really helps the community become so engaged with this process. It's a very exciting process. So we could include uh, other people in the charrette process, 
but we chose to include the public housing residents only. And the reason we do that is that, um, one, we, we truly believe that the wisdom is in the community. And uh, they are the best able to tell us what is happening in their community. The second reason we do it is that um, many times when you include residents in a, in a process with other folks, as you see the other circles here, which we would call the professionals of the world, the residents tend not to speak. So uh, we really wanted, and that was really critical. So we did charrette. The second thing we did as part of the assessment process was a health survey. And Phoenix Revitalization, the local CDC, was instrumental in, in uh, um, distributing the health survey to the housing, the, to the residents, uh, following up, getting, collecting those, those health surveys. And the surveys included um, health status information, access to health care, uh, health behaviors, including what kind of food people ate, where they got their food, uh, what kind of exercise or physical activity they used, they had, uh, where did they go. It included issues of safety. Um, so it, it, it's a broad health survey. The next part of the assessment were, were park and street audits. Uh, these are tools that, um, in fact, do just what it says. For park and the street are um, specific uh, they're individual tools that allow a very clear assessment of the um, either the park or the street. Um, we and they're standardized. Um, we used again the residents. We actually paid the residents to do the the street and park audits. Um, we and they were trained by Phoenix Revitalization. We did this intentionally, again, because, um, one, people know their neighborhood, so they could tell us which streets and which, and of course, the park to audit. But also, it, it really creates uh, some capacity among the residents in, un, in being able to articulate and advocate for um, their community and the changes they want. They may know that uh, the park didn't wasn't very uh, very good. Uh, pretty basic. Pretty basic is probably a step up, but um, but they couldn't tell you why. And after they do the audit, they can explain what was wrong with the park specifically. There were no drinking fountains. There were no. Um, there was not good um, playground equipment. The basketball court was in disrepair, and so forth and so on. So it gives them actual words to use to describe that. And then the final part of the, well, no, the next part of the assessment was really informal interviews with a whole host of people. Um, and as you can see, um, all the little lavender circles tell you who we talked to. And then, of course, we really needed to collect data. So we collected vital record data from the state and county health department. We collected health data from the school district, uh, which was fortunate. Uh, we collected um, housing data from the housing authority. And then, of course, streets and parks. And uh, we collected data all from a variety of folks. We also did hire an environmental consultant who did an environmental assessment because of the location of this property. And Jane, the environmental consultant would, would be different than someone, say, from a housing uh, environmental review. Yes, yeah, this would be a public public health environmental specialist. Okay. So what did we find? Well, um, you've, already, you've already probably gotten a suspicion of what we found. So the park was in disrepair. Um, the play equipment was was not up to code. It was it it is to this day still. Um, broken and, and the surfacing is not good. The basketball court is not in good repair. The housing units are aging and in a state of disrepair. And um, I think it's important. There's both indoor and outdoor air quality issues. And um, 
the outdoor air quality is really re related to the proximity to the freeways and some of the industrial areas around um, the property. But it, it is exacerbated, the indoor air is exacerbated because of the use of, um, well, the disrepair of the units, but also the use of evaporative coolers. So you can see the little arrow here. If you don't live in the southwest, you may not know what an evaporative cooler is. But the idea is in dry climates, dry hot climates, you can create cooling by uh, putting wet pads in a frame and running um, a fan or air through that. And it, in fact, cools through evaporation the, the inside of the building. Um, and it, in fact, works pretty well, but it's pretty high maintenance. And you can imagine a couple issues that go along with that. The windows and doors need to be open. And, um, and it's very, uh, unless it's maintained extremely well, it is uh, likely to get moldy and introduce mold into the units. So given that the air quality outside was poor, we, it just was exacerbated by the um, evaporative coolers. There were lots of vermin in the units um, just because of the age. Um, there's limited access to health, healthy food in the neighborhood. Um, the site is aged and in disrepair, you heard. There was inadequate shade and lighting on site, and you saw that when Gloria showed you sort of the minimalist look of the landscaping. Um, the site was teeming with rodents and stray dogs, and we really didn't appreciate that issue until we had the charrettes and the residents um, talk to us. And then the unsafe streets around the site, uh, I think Teresa mentioned 19th Avenue. This is a street that goes um, on the east side of the property. It's a major street. Uh, the the um, speed limit is 40 miles an hour. I would venture to tell you that um, if somebody is going 40 miles an hour, everybody is honking at them. No one goes 40 miles an hour. And there is no uh, access to public transportation uh, directly across. So many of the residents who are dependent on public transportation have to go down 19th Avenue and across um, at the next, uh, next crosswalks. So there's no crosswalk right at the entrance to the property. Uh, it really makes that street very unsafe. In fact, there have been a couple deaths. And then there's a lack of both what we call social cohesion and, and social activities. It's, um, um, we're getting an increasing amount of research understanding the health impact of, or the uh, health impact of, the, or the importance of social cohesion on health and why relationships and social supports are so important. And as we've talked about before, this is a very isolated neighborhood. So we identified five areas of health. Um, as you can see, healthy and safe uh, housing, access to healthy food, access to physical activity, access to safe streets and affordable transportation, and then social cohesion. Um, the recommendations, there were lots of recommendations, uh, and specifically in those five areas. But I, for today's meeting, I just grouped them in, in two areas those that related to the healthy and safe housing, and then uh, followed with um, the surrounding neighborhoods. So first, we're going to go back and look at healthy and safe housing. Um, the recommendation was to improve the air quality by replacing doors and windows and flooring and adding uh, regular air conditioning and heating. And um, we've done that. That recommendation really stems from the research that shows that 90% of um, the time people spend people spend 90% of their time indoors. So while the outdoor air is difficult for us to control, the indoor air is controllable and really has a major impact on the health uh, for residents. So this recommendation stems from that. Um, reduce hazardous materials such as lead and asbestos by getting the units and replacing roofs and adding soil. Um, clearly, there, there has been uh, some um, work around asbestos. And, and certainly, no lead paint had been used for many years. But 
without gutting the whole unit, it's hard to really um, completely eradicate both the lead and asbestos. And of course, there uh, is lead in the ground because of the uh, proximity to the freeway, and it was pro it was there during the time that lead gasoline was in use. Um, third was to improve the health condition due to rodents vermin by sealing the unit, constructing a block wall around the perimeter, and designing an effective water drainage system. <coughs> um, the fourth was to minimize the urban heat island um, by adding trees and reinstalling flood irrigation. For those of you who are freezing to death in the cold, you're thinking, just give me a little heat. But um, in fact, uh, heat is a major issue for us. And uh, in, in industrial areas where the, the property is located, it can actually be hotter than um, in more suburban areas or areas where there is more um, vegetation. And um, 5 degrees make, doesn't make much of a difference between 80 and 85 degrees, but it makes a lot of difference between 115 and 120 degrees. Finally, increasing safety by in increasing lighting in the complex. And Jane, before we get off this, I just want to point out, this is Teresa, um, that we don't normally recommend walling, uh, putting block walls around housing projects. Um, but in this case, as Jane pointed out, um, a block wall was really necessary to separate the residential units from the industrial units. Um, so I just want to make sure everybody understands that putting block walls around uh, housing developments is not something that we would normally recommend, but in this case, um, it made a lot of sense and, and contributed to an improved health. Uh, we believe it'll it'll improve the health of the residents. And then the areas around the, for the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, this kind of, this goes back to Gloria's comment that this is a, this redevelopment is an opportunity to enhance the neighborhood. And so uh, while perhaps um, the housing authority doesn't have responsibility to do some of these things, um, they, they really are part of a broader um, strategy. So one is to increase act options for healthy food. The second is to upgrade the existing park. Now the park is part of the property and is the responsibility of the housing authority, but um, but it's used by people other than the residents. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Reduce motor vehicle and pedestrian injuries. <coughs> Jane's just getting over a cold, so we're glad she's here today at all. Uh, I'm just going to take over for a moment um, just to talk about 19th Avenue. Um, one of the suggestions was putting in a crosswalk that would be accessible to the pedestrians. And then certainly controlling the population of um, stray dogs. And then really important component is increasing the social cohesion. Um, and you see a picture here of the uh, community center. And Gloria's going to talk about some of the steps that they've taken. What did the housing authority do to integrate the recommendations from the health impact assessment into the scope of work? Um, and this is where the work begins. You have this wonderful report that um, gives you uh, many recommendations and has a lot of data and a lot of information. Um, to the right, you'll see the renderings of the new um, buildings and the redevelopment um, renderings of what COFELT is going to be looking like as soon as we close all the financing and get it under construction. So we definitely um, took every single recommendation, um, incorporated it into our planning process for the redevelopment. We will be gutting the units 100%. The full interiors will be totally gutted. We will replace all doors and windows. Everything will be energy efficient and up to um, a fairly good energy standard. Um, we are adding to the three and four bathrooms a second bath. The three, four bathrooms, the occupancy is six, eight, ten people, and they're sharing one bath. So we are adding. Um, a second bath to the three and four bedrooms. We will be replacing all the swamp coolers with the HVA system, which is the heating and, and cooling system. Um, the whole complex will have a new lighting plan 
um, which again will be an energy standard lighting plan. And the landscaping, um, Jane mentioned putting back the irrigation system. Um, we will have uh, more lush landscaping and a lot, a lot of uh, trees are spending a lot of time on the landscaping design now. Um, and we did mention earlier the fencing around the property will help us with um, the neighboring businesses and um, especially with the stray um, dogs that enter the property. Um, access to healthy food, we don't have a, um, a good grocery store or retailers uh, close by, so we have um, gone into an agreement with Fresh Express, um, and this is a mobile bus. Uh, they were old City of Phoenix buses that were turned into these mobile um, systems that come out to uh, various sites to give people access to uh, fresh produce and fruit. So we have them coming uh, twice a month to the property. We've already started that process because we'd like to start integrating as much as we can now. Um, and in the development, we've um, incorporated uh, a space for community garden. Um, physical activity, um, the Arizona Community Foundation and Liz have funded the design of an intergenerational park. We have this one and a half acre park that we really, really wanted to spend some time with the residents figuring out what would be the optimum um, type of activities for the residents and what would they love to use um, right there adjacent to the property. So um, that was funded. The City of Phoenix Parks and Rec uh, Department, we have a cooperative agreement with them. They do some services currently. They are adding um, this to their 2015-2016 budget for a park uh, coordinator, and it includes some maintenance of, of this uh, park. So that's a really, really good thing. And, and I feel like this has come together because of this health impact assessment. People see this as as a real viable project and something they should invest in. Um, the school district where we have the um, Hamilton School immediately next door, we're um, coordinating some services there for the computer center that is going to be in, in the community center and help coordinate and share services with the school. We've already started the arts for Mobile to get the kids engaged in, in the arts program. It includes uh, music and, and arts, so that has already started and that again, is part of engaging the residents into this more cohesion community. And this is Teresa. I, people might be asking, what, what's the difference between an intergenerational activity space and a <coughs> playground for the kids? And I just want to say one thing. When we saw the plans, um, they replaced some of those, you know, those sling swings that kids ha see that none of us, none, no adults can sit in them, and they replaced them <coughs> with, like, front porch swings. You know, they were, they're just so beautiful, and, and they're really open to, uh, to having people of all ages use that type of uh, park activity. Go ahead, Gloria. And access to safe streets and transit. The, you know, those are two things that are out of our control. They actually belong with the city of Phoenix and then the transit authority. But the communication has started, and they've been part of our stakeholder meetings, which we have held. I don't know, four or five of them, and have invited all the different department heads within the county and the city. So the city of Phoenix has agreed to improve um, bus shelters on 19th Avenue, which is a very, very um, busy um, arterial street. Um, city of Phoenix has commissioned um, a study for a hot crossing light, which is in this photo here. It's a much safer way to get people um, crossed. Um, on 19th Avenue with a very bu busy arterial street. Um, they are looking at the islands in the center and some improvement on landscaping. So we think if we get the hot light, we get the bus shelter, it's the beginning to at least get it on the planning screen for the City of Phoenix Street Department. And it was, it was helpful that the City of Phoenix recently this summer adopted a complete streets policy. Those, for those of you housers who aren't familiar with that, um, it is a way to encourage um, multimodal transportation options uh, for all residents, whether you're mobile and on a skateboard, a bicycle, using a stroller or a walker. It's a great way to, to completely redesign streets and street uses. The uh, social cohesion, um, we've been doing a lot of planning around um, resident engagement, and I think the HIA helped us with that because the residents have been so involved in um, the charrettes and the workshops and have learned a lot about their community and themselves and what their needs are. Um, and also we did um, some planning around the intergenerational park and some input around, you know, what would make sense for this park. So they've been participating um, in all these meetings. And so we will continue that, um, keeping the residents um, 
informed as we go through the development process and uh, through a newsletter and notices in English and Spanish. Um, the Phoenix Revitalization Corporation has agreed to put this project as part of a resident leadership uh, program to train the residents in the engagement piece of it and using the arts and the resident participation in preserving some of the history. We do have a committee who's working on um, some art pieces using the concrete and recycling the concrete to make pottery and other things for the property, pot, uh, pots around the property with uh, plants. And then we will be using the old clotheslines to make some art pieces around the property. And then um, the office will have some photos and some other things about the history of the property. So the residents are participating in this piece of it also. So we thought that was important to um, honor and preserve the history of this property. So um, Gloria, why don't you tell us, uh, from again, from your perspective, the value of the health impact assessment? We've sort of been over a lot of the different components, but you know, take us back out through some of these, um, these ideas. Well, some of the things we received as far as input from the residents is that they felt very empowered and were part of the decision-making process as we went through this. They were very engaged in the research. Um, they went out and did some of the audits, and they participated in the charrettes. So they felt very engaged, and their voice was being heard. So that was, that was very, very good. The other piece of it is once we had the report, we rolled it out by inviting the various department heads of the city of Phoenix and the county to come in and see what the report recommendations were and what we found. And that was really important to get their um, input and their participation in collaborating with us in responding and mitigating some of the things that were identified. Well, and just to add to that, this is Jane, I think this, this is an important piece that uh, Gloria and her team brought all these, these agencies, both state and city and, and county. county together because then the, each of these agencies can begin to see their piece of this puzzle. So I, I always use the example of the animal control guy who came and heard about the not just stray dogs but the guard dogs that get into the property. And he had a whole, he has already implemented an extensive plan to remedy that. Uh, so I think what happens is that instead of seeing a, this enormous uh, report, people are able to see their piece of uh, the project and their piece of the action and can do something about it. Uh, so I think Gloria's leadership in bringing all these folks together has been really uh, pretty remarkable. And I think it also helped people to see that it wasn't just the Housing Authority's problem. It was a problem or a challenge for everybody. And we, we feel we've gotten a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of passion for uh, funding this project. You know, some of the funding that's come through from the Arizona Community Foundation list, we just were before the city council yesterday for some additional funding with the city of Phoenix. They're very, very aware of this project. Yes, we've had to respond to that, the HIA, and how are we going to mitigate some of these recommendations and what are we going to do about it, but I think it's our responsibility. Um, to know what we're dealing with. So we think that this project is going to be much better because of the health impact assessment. And certainly from Liz's perspective, we felt that having the health impact assessment would help us raise additional uh, funding for the improvement of the, of the public housing project. This truly is a public-private partnership, and we think that it's a, it's a model that we hope can be um, replicated um, not just across our city, county and state, but throughout the country. So you see on your page um, some resources. Uh, if you use that link, this will take you to the full um, health impact assessment, which is probably 75 pages long, and then the case study, which is about a dozen pages long. And I, with that, Janet, we'd like to go ahead and turn it back over to you. Thank you, Teresa, Gloria, and Jane for that wonderful presentation. Um, now is the time where all of you attendees get to ask your burning questions of our presenters. And we have a few that have come in already. Um, right now I have the image up so you can see how you can ask a question. Um, so feel free to send those in. And I'm going to get started reading them aloud to our presenters. The first question that came in was, how was the resident survey developed? Um, so this, is this, Jane. this is Jane. Uh, we had we used a variety of uh, 
other tools to develop the resident surveys. And we built it uh, primarily on a tool that was developed for uh, health impact assessments done in, um, on a project along the light rail doing health impact assessments for various stations along the proposed light rail expansions. So um, we had a model to use already. Um, and Jane, there is a national resource for health impact assessments, yes? There is. And what is that? <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head. You know, we can send that in, and, and uh, is there a way to put that on the website? I mean, on the... I, if you send me the link, I can make sure it goes out in an email to everyone yes. to register. I will do that. Great. Okay. So we have a, another question, which is, how are the housing improvement recommendations different from what you might get from just hiring an architect or a planner to upgrade the housing development? This is Gloria. Um, I would say they're different because you know um, some of the environmental issues that are going on. You know the street issues that are going on. Uh, usually when you do a redevelopment, you just really focus in on your um, brick and mortar um, part of that, and you really are not incorporating the full neighborhood. So this incorporated, um, you know, the uh, 19th Avenue Street, not having access to, you know, good, healthy food. Uh, it incorporated the school. So it's a, it's a lot different when you have a lot of information, a lot of data in incorporating some of the um, features and some of the things that you're going to do for your development. This is Jane. Um, in this particular project, um, my guess is, that all the recommendations that were housing unit specific probably would have been done regardless of a health impact assessment. But we did another one with, with the Housing Authority of Maricopa County in the, for another property. Um, and during the course of the uh, health impact assessment, we really determined uh, almost, a, well, over a third of the population was either old or um, disabled, which led to pretty significant recommendations about um, universal access um, um, standards. So I think that the Housing Authority had already planned to have a certain amount of housing that was for disabled, but didn't really appreciate how many seniors and or people who were somewhat disabled and needed universal access uh, standards and, and de uh, development. Um, so I think they changed how they thought about uh, a lot of the units based on that. And, and this is Teresa. I would also say that um, for those states that require um, cost justification for certain changes or um, improvements for tax credit projects or redevelopment, um, having the health data um, as sort of backup for the justification of particular changes, um, you know, changing out all the H, uh, all the swamp coolers to HVAC, uh, and being able to trace it back to the impact that this will help have on the incidence of asthma uh, for children, and then how that affects school attendance. I mean, being able to sort of create that entire story um, that moves from just making basic changes um, and rehabbing a unit to really creating healthy environments. Um, the data tells the story, and the impact goes beyond just um, a person living in a particular unit. Thank you. The next question that came in is, has any evidence-based health outcomes become clear yet from this great partnership, particularly around physical activity? Well, actually, the project is only beginning, so ground will we are planning to close the um, construction financing in March of next year. So um, we will be monitoring. Part of the process will be to monitor and see what the health impact is and the outcomes would be. And I would say that's probably the biggest challenge um, of looking at um, health impacts and you know sort of the causality between the changes that are made and the and the long term effects. Um, Monitoring and evaluating this type of activity 
is really a long-term commitment, and there, there, there is never any money for it. So we're going to have to get creative about how we're going to administer you know, an evaluation strategy, who's going to be responsible, who's going to be there um, in the long term, and certainly um, ensuring that the residents themselves understand um, the part that they play in making sure that some of these recommendations are completed, acted upon, and are tracking for themselves uh, the changes in their own health. Thank you. Another question that came in was, how long was the charrette? Uh, the charrettes last about uh, two and a half hours. Um, we, we used to have them last almost all day, but we, we've, gotten, we've gotten much better at, at refining that. So they last about two and a half hours, and they always include food. We, it always includes food, it includes child care, and, it, and it's always done at least bilingually, and then sometimes with other languages as well. Um, so, um, but we have it down to about two and a half hours. Great. Um, another question that came in was, how is sustainability incorporated into the project? And then there's a, a similar question that also came in about whether solar was being incorporated. Um, we are not incorporating solar into the um, development currently, but we are meeting um, some very high energy standards that are required by the uh, low income housing tax credit program. So we are incorporating all the um, energy standards and features that we can to make it very sustainable and very affordable. One of the biggest um, savings for us is going to be on the irrigation system. We currently spend about $380,000 a year on water for the VAP system and the watering system there. So reinstituting the irrigation system and the analysis done there will bring that down to about 120000 a year um, with just those two things. So it is going to be important to incorporate energy standards and features. Thank you. Uh, another question for you is, can you talk about how long the HIA took to complete? I, it, we completed it, I believe, in a four-month period, which is pretty aggressive um, in, in that it takes a while to collect the data and do, uh, and do all of these different steps, um, but it was about four months. And uh, we did the other one in about the same amount of time. And again, I, I think it can, it, uh, the timing is important. I don't think you can do one um, in a, thoroughly in less than four months. On the other hand, um, you don't want it to drag out longer than about five, maybe six months. So I would say for a project like this, it would be four to six months. You, I think this is Teresa. I think you also um, run into the danger of participation fatigue. Um, you know, anybody, any resident in any neighborhood um, gets tired of going to meetings over and over and over again. Uh, they have their lives to live and, and a lot of different aspects of that. Um, and for low-income people, that's only exacerbated by the fact that they, you know, are, are always challenged by the resources, finding the resources they need, whether it's food, transportation, health care, et cetera. So it was really important to be sensitive to the fact that we needed to do a thorough study and, and yet not, um, we need to be considerate about the, the amount of time that the residents could provide to participate in this. Well, and the other, I think, important issue is that it, it needed to be done in a timely enough fashion that the housing authority could use it as part of their planning. If it drags out too long, by the time it's done, then the housing authority is already, and the developer have moved, you know, moved on. So I think it has to be done in a timely way to make it relevant. And I think that's what makes the health impact assessment in the housing arena unusual, because if, in the transportation arena, for example, those of you who are familiar with transportation planning know that it takes years, you know, to get through the transportation planning uh, for a new light rail line or a a freeway you know, extension, but in housing, 
um, we know that we've got certain deadlines to meet, whether they're funding deadlines, get your tax credit application in, or your application to the city for subsidy financing, whatever it is. Um, putting this tool into the housing arena really requires you to be very sensitive to, to the owner of the property, the developer, and the residents um, all at once in addition to making sure that you get use this tool appropriately. Thank you. We have another question, um, which is, did the, did the HIA also include a quantification of the financial cost of existing health issues or the financial benefits to the housing development and the broader community? For example, the savings to the health department through less mold in the houses when the air conditioners are replaced. If so slash not, would you suggest people consider this if they're doing an HIA? Um, it was not done. Um, I think for that's why, as part of the discussion, we talked about using both primary and secondary data. Uh, we began using secondary data to look at um, some of those issues because that's that's really a, a research model, and somebody needs to devote not just uh, time but uh, a great deal of money into doing that kind of uh, evaluation. So it was not done. Um, I, it's a pretty daunting task to try to cost out um, on an individual project basis those some of those issues. Um, we what we did use some secondary information around uh, the number of children with asthma and the percent of school days lost and that sort of thing. But um, it, it, in order to be able to really uh, cost out that data, you really need to have um, a, a much purer pure research project and, and fund it accordingly, which would be probably make AHIA not affordable for most housing projects. Thank you. We also have a, another question somewhat along those lines, which is, what was the budget and time frame for this project? So the HIA itself, um, you know, going through the steps that Jane outlined and the four-month process was $30,000. And that paid for the um, expert consultants that um, the environmental, uh, the epidemiologist, um, people like that, as well as sort of the project manager who managed all the, um, the different steps um, and it made sure that the community was engaged, and then the, uh, the funding for the nonprofit for, uh, entity that did the actual sort of on the ground administering surveys, helping the people understand how to do audits and so on. So over the course of the four months, um, $30,000 was what we had to, to work with, and we made it happen. Um, certainly since that time, additional funding has, uh, was made available to do the case study analysis. And then we also took one particular component of the recommendations, the changing the playground into an intergenerational activity space. And we were able to get some additional funding from the Community Foundation to create the design for the park, uh, the redesign of the park, uh, which is very exciting. You saw that on one of the slides, which incorporates a community garden. Uh, a mural, a water feature, and so on. Um, the cost of, of actual construction is relatively high, and we continue to be engaged and will be engaged over the next year to see if we can find additional private funding um, to include those enhancements in the park. But for the actual HIA itself, it was $30,000. Great. Uh, we had a question come in asking whether there were any policies developed to reduce secondhand smoke exposure. Well, you know, one of the, this is Gloria from the Housing Authority. Um, we are currently incorporating um, a smoke-free um, environment into some of our public housing projects, not all of them. But as we uh, redevelop and, and reconstruct our pro properties, we definitely are um, incorporating um, smoke-free environments for our residents. We um, have been working with the um, Maricopa County Public Health regarding the policies and have um, 
pretty much outline what our standard policy will be. We also, for the tax credits, have um, checked off that box for the additional points for smoke-free. Um, so we're very interested in incorporating that into um, this property and all new developed properties. And speaking of policy changes, um, I, I want to say that uh, both our state housing department, the Arizona Department of Housing, and our local HUD office have been very interested in whether or not we can um, make uh, health impact assessments sort of part of the standard, standard business procedures when looking at redevelopment of older properties especially. Um, as well as construction of new units, uh, perhaps in vacant lots. Um, what we were able to do from this work, um, because the state was very interested in it, was to uh, suggest during the most recent qualified allocation plan um, update was to look at incorporating what we call healthy communities recommendations. So for example, uh, the current QAP um, calls for um, additional points if you're within one mile of a grocery store. What we were able to do is, for example, suggest that it's not just being within one mile of a grocery store, it's whether or not that one mile is walkable and you're not separated by a, a freeway that you can't cross, um, that the grocery store can accept WIC payments, for example, um, or food stamps, things like that. So we actually got the housing authority to do a little bit of a deeper dive and make these healthy community recommendations um, incorporated in the qualified allocation plan. So um, that, that hasn't been finalized yet. We're hoping to see those uh, this month because that will be part of the next year's um, tax credit application. Thank you. Uh, so we have time for one more question, which is where does the funding for the case study analysis come from? And do you have any recommendations for sources of follow-up funding to do HIA work? Well, again, LISC used our um, Section 4 money for increasing the capacity of local nonprofits to undertake comprehensive community revitalization. And we felt that um, this was a very innovative approach utilizing, um, you know, combining health and housing. We felt that that was really appropriate. And we wanted our nonprofit partners to explore the application of that. So we used our HUD Section 4 funds uh, for both the case study and, and the, first, the first part of the HIA. Uh, but secondarily, I think that there are opportunities for approaching funders that have not really been engaged either in community development or affordable housing specifically, and looking at these non-traditional um, housing funders and, and introducing them to the connection between health and housing. And there are, there are a number of funders nationally, uh, Robert Wood Johnson, uh, for example, um, Pew, uh, Charitable Trust, uh, Kresge, that are really starting to explore um, this crossover between health and housing and, uh, and how um, having a, a healthy house, a healthy neighborhood um, creates um, healthier residents in a community. So these are some national funders um, at the local level. Um, we've got some funders that are interested specifically in helping to build out that playground so to increase healthy activity for children. Um, the city of Phoenix is looking at, uh, as we explained, looking at the, the pedestrian crosswalk, um, making investments that would not otherwise have been considered without having the data and the backup that the HIA provided for making that argument. Um, if you're considering a HIA or, or just beginning to explore the idea, I would contact your county health department or your state health department because the Centers for Disease Control is trying to help uh, state and county health departments build their capacity to, to come to the table with, with um, different partners to be able to do health impact assessments. And they have funding coming down through those routes uh, along with RWJ and um, Pew. So I would start with both the county and state health departments. Great, thank you. So with that, there have been some requests that we send around a copy of the HIA that you've completed for this project, which I will be sure to include in the follow-up email with a, a link to the recording of this webinar. Uh, there's also been a request for a copy of the survey that was sent to residents. Um, if, if you can send that along to me, I will also share that. It's, and it's in an appendix with the uh, health impact assessment. Perfect. I will make a note of that in the follow-up email. Thank you, Jane. Um, there was also a, a shout-out 
recommending Pew as a, a source for information on HIA as well. Um, so with that, I want to thank you, Teresa, Jane, and Gloria, for this wonderful presentation. And I'd like to thank everyone still on the webinar for your attendance and your great questions. And finally, I'd like to thank Capital One for its financial support of NHC's webinar series. Thank you again for joining us today.